Attention duped masses! You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Robot maps, poison papers, and the right stuff. Plus this day in history with MTV's launch and our song of the day by Bell and Sebastian on your morning monarchy for August 1st, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com and giving you another hour-long blast of listener-supported media brought to you by you. And I'll tell you right out, this is our last day of doing Media Monarchy before we take a little summer vacation. I've got festivals, i got concerts, i got a 40th birthday coming up in a little bit. We are going to do today, bang up job. And then we're taking a little bit of time off. We will be back Monday, August 14th. Hopefully I can have a couple little interviews and a couple little bits post out while we are taking a break. And hopefully you're taking a break. It is summer. The whole reason we fight and try and get involved in all this stuff is though so we can live our lives. And I'm glad you're living your life. And hopefully you can join us here live. We are live. 9 a.m. Pacific Time, MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. So typically, each day of the week, we focus in on a different area of the news, Monday's World News, and Tuesday is technology. What we're going to do here on this Cyberspace War Tuesday, since it's going to be our last day for a little bit, we're going to jam in everything. Where It's going to be Cyberspace War, but it's also going to have Food World Order, Holy Hexes, and a little bit of media memes, and it's all going to be jammed in. So share the link, tell a friend, MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. Let's glance now at our breaking lamestream news, my friends. The five key questions on Trump's role in his son's statement on the Russia meeting. As the Russia hysteria just continues on and on and on and on. And oh yeah, that's right, in case you missed yesterday's episode, the head of Homeland Security is now the head of the White House. Nothing to worry about there. The Washington Compost talking about a timeline of the explosive lawsuit alleging a White House link in the Seth Rich conspiracy. Venezuelan opposition leaders taken into custody overnight, as we've been talking about the situation in Venezuela. And there's a Moscow court shooting. Gang suspects killed in escape bid. So that's a glance at your breaking lamestream news, and as we've been enjoying, let's look at the fact check, shall we? NHS staff. How many foreign staff work in the NHS? BBC. Trump's border boast. Fact check. J.K. Rowling falsely accuses Trump of not shaking disabled boy's hand. PolitiFact. Is this a Russian pilot flying under a bridge in 1965? Snopes. And Jenny McCarthy's son called A-list celebrities? Gossip Cop. That's all the important news for you because you couldn't possibly figure out what to think about Jenny McCarthy without the alphabet incorporated in the New York Times helping you out, right? Because you're a little dummy. Which, if you've spent 15,000 hours in compulsory education, we're all, we're all a little dumb. Let's dive into it, and as we note a lot of times, so we do your hour-long morning news show. Then, a little bit later, we do an hour-long music show called Pump Up the Volume. Morning Monarchy, Pump Up the Volume. Of course, we also got New World next week, Good News next week, The Mary Jane Report. It seems like so many things end up being breaking news stories while we're doing the music show. But while I'm doing the news show, there's no... No news breaks. And then we're trying to play some music and chill out, and then all the news starts to break. So Scaramucci did the Fandango out the door, what was it, 11 days as White House Communication Director? As our buddy Crimson Miss notes, so much for being DHS Chief of Staff, Kelly's tag team partner. That would have been, I don't know if entertaining is the word, but it definitely would have been something. So let's dive into our cyberspace war news, my friends. And again, everything we say and play on these shows will always be included in the show notes. In this extra jam-packed episode, we tweeted out all the stories about an hour before showtime. A ban on pedestrians looking at mobile phones or texting while crossing the street will take effect in Hawaii's largest city in late October, as Honolulu becomes the first major American city to pass legislation aimed at reducing injuries and deaths from smartphone zombies. The ban comes as cities around the world grapple with how to protect phone-obsessed smartphone zombies from distracted walking from injuring themselves by stepping into traffic or running into stationary objects. Now, of course, there's hilarious videos that you can watch of all the people falling all over themselves. Starting October 25th, Mayor Kirk Caldwell told reporters on Thursday, Honolulu pedestrians can be fined between $15 and $99, depending on the number of times police catch them looking at a phone or tablet device as they cross the street. We hold the unfortunate distinction of being a major city with more pedestrians being hit in crosswalks, particularly our seniors, than almost any other city in the country. Yeah, I wish they were shoegazers. They're not. They're phone gazers. And I've made the note to you as well, when we've recently switched apartments, got a little balcony, moved up in the world. I can now stand on that balcony, look down, and see everybody driving by in their cars, 
Everybody's got a fucking phone in their hands. I'm surprised it's not crash up derby out there all the time. It's people, you know, they've got jobs to drive to. For working and stuff. Because you gotta make that money so you can buy a robot that not only cleans your house, but also maps all of your home and sells all that data. Your trusty vacuum may be looking to sell your home's floor plan. That's the goal iRobot has concocted for the future of its company. They're the makers of the popular automated vacuum Roomba. By bumping around corners, the robot's camera is able to make a map of your home to better avoid furniture. In an interview with Reuters, iRobot CEO Colin Angle reveals that's potentially lucrative data for some very big players. Amazon, Apple, and Google could all be interested parties in its quest to bring consumers on board with its smart home vision. He said, There's an entire ecosystem of things and services that the smart home can deliver once you have a rich map of the home that the user has allowed to be shared. Already, a recent update to the Roomba allows it to work in tandem with Amazon's Alexa to start or stop cleaning. iRobot CEO says a deal could be reached within the next few years. Good googly moogly. Will iRobot clean up by selling mapping data of customers' homes captured by the company's popular robotic vacuum cleaners? That specter was raised when iRobot CEO Colin Angle told Reuters that, quote, there's an entire ecosystem of things and services that the smart home can deliver once you have a rich map of the home that the user has allowed to be shared. An angle suggested that iRobot could sell such maps within a couple of years. And of course, Apple, Amazon, Google Parent, Alphabet Incorporated, at least one competitor immediately seized on the risk to customer privacy, saying, quote, We have a very different approach to our mapping technology and what it means for our consumers, says Christopher Kane, head of marketing at Ecovax. Here's the takeaway. This is a very sensitive thing for customers, for consumers, their homes, and we have to realize that we're no longer just selling appliances. We are selling interactive nodes that are loose in your home, and if we don't approach this carefully, it has the risk to become a very invasive thing. Kind of like the robots and microphones that people have installed in their homes. So what do we have to check when we walk in people's homes? Hey, Alexa, order me a dollhouse and some cookies check and see if their home is wired and spying on you. Plus, you might also want to look and see if the robot is spying on you as well. This is idiocracy. Jesus. Meanwhile, one of the nation's largest cybersecurity conferences is inviting attendees to get hands-on experience hacking a slew of voting machines, demonstrating to researchers how easy the process can be. It only took me a few minutes to see how to hack it, said security consultant Thomas Richards, glancing at a premier election solutions machine currently in use in Georgia. The DEF CON cybersecurity conference held annually in Las Vegas this year. For the first time, the conference is hosting a voting machine village where attendees can try and hack a number of systems and help catch vulnerabilities. The conference acquired 30 machines for hackers to toy with. Every voting machine in the village was hacked. Though voting machines are technologically simple, they are difficult for researchers to obtain for independent research. It's a whole other reason why you shouldn't really mess with closed source systems. The machine that Richards learned how to hack used beneath-the-surface software known as firmware, designed in 2007. But a number of well-known vulnerabilities in that firmware have developed over the past decade. I didn't come in knowing what to expect, but I was surprised by what I found. Hackers breach dozens of voting machines brought to conference. Every single one of them. Now, we often note that these are the same machines that are running... ATMs all around the world constantly, and do you think they're losing a dime or a cent? But just somehow, once every four years, when you get to pick a new ruler, just can't figure that out. More hackers hacking things that of little consequence. Hackers broke into the networks of home box office, that's right, HBO, and reportedly leaked unreleased episodes of a number of shows, as well as the script for next week's Game of Thrones episode, which I believe, spoiler, has computer-generated dragons. 
Although they've reportedly obtained a total of 1.5 terabytes of data, HBO confirmed the intrusion in a statement sent to Variety, which is where we're grabbing this piece from. Quote, HBO recently experienced a cyber incident, which resulted in the compromise of proprietary information. We immediately began investigating the incident and are working with law enforcement and outside cybersecurity firms. Data protection is a top priority at HBO, and we take seriously our responsibility to protect the data we hold. Because that's how we make money off of you. Entertainment Weekly was actually the first to report about the hack and allegedly leaked content. According to that report, the hackers have already leaked unreleased episodes of Ballers and Room 104. Man! HBO chairman and CEO Richard Plepler addressed the hack in an email to employees calling it disruptive, unsettling, and disturbing for all of us. The problem before us is unfortunately all too familiar in the world we now find ourselves a part of. Yeah, you helped create it. And the White House just got fished. Same way that it happened to old Podesta. So everywhere we look, you basically see... Do I use the word tyranny? It's, a, it's like a soft tyranny. It's a soft tyranny that we all kind of enjoy. I mean, you guys said in the chat a little bit ago, the future will basically be bent over people. The future of humanity is hunched over. But let's, let's try some good news, shall we? Let's hop to a site called Tech Caption with the article, Meet the New YouTube Powered by BitTorrent with No Censorship. That's right, you know what we're talking about. The latest YouTuber's rebellion left a tense atmosphere of confrontation between creators of content and those responsible for YouTube. See the previously mentioned Alphabet Incorporated. Right in the middle of all this controversy has been born BitChute, a streaming video page that works under BitTorrent, BitTorrent technology. Although it looks a lot like the YouTube website, BitChute is a platform which videos are not uploaded directly to a server from which later each user consumes bandwidth to play the streaming file, but are themselves users who become the hosts of these files. It is, in short, a sample of the philosophy of P2P taken to video in streaming. The BitChute website works under the so-called WebTorrent technology in which the users themselves are part of the infrastructure that allows videos to be reproduced from anywhere in the world. As in BitTorrent users indirectly help others to download a torrent file faster, in WebTorrent applies the same idea but for the consumption of videos in streaming. As BitChute creator Ray Vahi commented in an interview, the more users are watching videos on this alternative webpage than YouTube, the more efficient the page can play the videos hosted on it. The user, on the other hand, doesn't need to install any programs to be a part of the network of seeders that help the videos to load faster. In fact, WebTorrent itself is a technology that works directly in the browser. So to enter the page of BitChute doesn't require the installation of any type of program. Simply enter the web, click on a video, and it will start to play back. But this website does not only aim to become one of the first torrent-type alternatives to YouTube. The page is, according to its creators, a response to the policies that the tech giant Google-owned videos page, YouTube, has been applying over content creators in recent years. Definitely post America's Next Top President selection, everything got ratcheted up. That's when everything kind of popped. And in a lot of ways, maybe they're right. Maybe it was a sort of 9-11 style event. You know, com completely manufactured and stage managed and used to its maximum psychological effect. They were ready to make these changes. They just needed a catalyzing catastrophic event and America's next top president just really fit the bill. So everybody's lost their mind since November 9th, 2016. And that let the powers that shouldn't be in the three or five media corporations that run everything kind of act out. So all those changes have all been kicking in and that's why we all started to unfollow divest, boycott, leave it. So that's essentially your cyberspace war news using hashtag cyberspace war. Again, all our news is brought to you by you. We are not only crowdfunded, but we are crowdsourced. We're going to move through the other areas of the media monarchy kingdom for the remainder of this morning monarchy episode. Again, it is our last before we take a little summer vacation and it is Tuesday, August 1st, 2017. I'm glad you're here. I'm James Evan Pilato at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. Let's peruse the poison papers, shall we, as we dive into a little bit of food world order news. The Bioscience Resource Project and the Center for Media and Democracy released a trove of rediscovered and newly digitized chemical industry and regulatory agency documents stretching back to the 1920s. And there are links to download all these, poisonpapers.org. 
Together, the papers show that both industry and regulators understood the extraordinary toxicity of many chemical products and worked together to conceal this information from the public and the press. These papers will transform our understanding of the hazards posed by certain chemicals on the market and the fraudulence of some of the regulatory processes relied upon to protect human health and the environment. These documents represent a tremendous trove of previously hidden or lost evidence of chemical regulatory activity and chemical safety. What is most striking about these documents is their heavy focus on the activities of regulators. Said Dr. Jonathan Latham, executive director of the Bioscience Research Project, saying again, quote, Time and time again, regulators went to extreme lengths of setting up secret committees, deceiving the media and the public, and covering up evidence of human exposure and human harm. These secret activities extended and increased human exposure to the chemicals they knew to be toxic. The Poison Papers are a compilation of more than 20,000 documents obtained from federal agencies and chemical manufacturers via open records requests and public interest litigation. They include scientific studies and summaries of studies, internal memos and reports, meeting minutes, strategic discussions, and sworn testimonies. Also, I'm not really sure where that music is coming from. So we'll let that kind of hang out in the background for a minute until we work that out. <laughs> I supply my own music. Thank you very much, web browser. The majority of these documents have been scanned and digitized for the first time and represent nearly three tons of material. The regulatory agency sources of these documents include the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the U.S. Department of Agriculture and Forest Service, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, the Veterans Administration, and the Department of Defense. Chemical manufacturers referenced in the documents include Dow, Monsanto, DuPont, and Union Carbide, as well as many smaller manufacturers and the commercial testing companies who pimp for them. That's my word. The Poison Papers catalog the secret concerns of industry and regulators over the hazards of pesticides and other chemicals and their efforts to conceal those concerns. Most of the Poison Papers were collected by author and activist Carol Van Strum. In total, the stark truth revealed by these 50 years of documents is that the entire pesticide industry could not exist without lies, cover-ups, rampant fraud, and government enablers, said Vanstrom, who authored the 1983 book, Bitter Fog, Herbicides and Human Rights. This article goes on and on. It basically, what I'm reading from right here on Sign of the Times, just kind of walks you through what it has. The secrecy, the collusion, the deception, the cover-up, the concealment, and the intent. Everything you would need if this were a fair game to bring them to court. So we're going to have to dive more into the Poison Papers. And again, poisonpapers.org. Secret concerns of industry and regulators on the hazards of pesticides and other chemicals that they love to feed you. But of course, you stupid conspiracy theorists, they're not making gay frogs or anything, right? Meanwhile, over in Colorado Springs, Colorado, the Air Force doesn't plan to reimburse three Colorado communities for the money spent responding to water contamination caused by toxic firefighting foam previously used at a military base, potentially leaving the towns with an $11 million tab. Firefighting foam used at Peterson Air Force Base for decades sinked, seeped into the wide field aquifer, making well water in southern El Paso County unsafe to drink. Security, wide field, and fountains water districts have so far spent $6 million responding to the contamination, and that is expected to balloon to $12.7 million by the end of next year. The Air Force pledged $4.3 million in aid, and only $1.7 million of that amount will go to the water districts. Much of the rest is being spent on bottled water and filters. Nestle thanks you, Air Force. Buy all that bottled water. Buy all that plastic. Buy all that water stolen from other communities. Hey, why don't you take some from Oregon? We're not using it. We don't pay back. We cannot reimburse, said Cornell Long, a chemist with the Air Force Civil Engineer Center. An email sent to the newspaper from the Engineer Center in response to a request for clarification said, The Air Force does not have the authority to reimburse communities for costs incurred in dealing with environmental contamination issues. The military plans to continue studying the toxic chemicals in the foam and their effects on residents' health until 2019. Air Force officials said last week they do not expect to carry out a remediation plan for the contaminated wells until next decade. Investigators found toxic chemicals from the foam reached concentrations of more than 1,250 times the level that even the EPA says is okay. 
An Air Force report released last Tuesday said that other sources likely contributed to the aquifer's contamination, though none has been identified. So the military basically says, oh, I don't know, there's, there's all kinds of people spilling chemicals. Are you sure it was our chemicals? If you want to fight for the environment, you must be vehemently anti-war. And already be against the next war, as they say. Good God, I know, I've mentioned we're trying to, we've, we've got to move to New Mexico or Colorado next year. We've got to be closer to Cassie's parents. And of course, anytime I look at those places, I'm like, oh, hmm, do I want to move to New Mexico where there's crime and plague? Or do I want to move to Colorado where there's New World Order, military police state, and poison in the water? Those are your choices. Good God. Not just anti-war. Must take honest look at all government-run activity. That's exactly right. Those are the words of wisdom over in the chat from our friend Charmander. We are streaming live, MediaMonarchy.com slash listen, and we are cramming in all our news. And at least in Colorado, I will be legally able to sedate myself. Prairie dogs with a taste for peanut butter, scientists reported recently, can now be vaccinated against plague, the black death that killed much of Europe centuries ago. Plague, which arrived in the United States through San Francisco in 1900, has persisted in rodents in the American Southwest. Their fleas may carry the Yersinia pestis bacterium, which causes the illness, and the parasites sometimes bite pets and humans. Last week, New Mexico reported its third human case of plague this year. The once unstoppable disease can be cured with antibiotics if it's caught early. Wildlife officers sometimes try to control plague among prairie dogs by dusting their colonies with insecticides. But that's really labor intensive and pesticide resistance in some fleas has been reported, of course, because of massive overuse. Over the course of a three year study described in the journal EcoHealth, scientists from the United States Geological Survey working with federal, state, and tribal park rangers in seven states, distributed baits, all of which were bright red, the size of a large sugar cube and peanut butter flavored, in 58 prairie dog colonies scattered around the Rocky Mountains and the High Plains. Some contained a vaccine invented at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and some contained placebo. In later plague outbreaks, which occur cyclically, no colony was completely spared, but dogs in vaccinated colonies were nearly twice as likely to survive, the study found. So there's plague on the prairie, but these dogs might be protected. I'm not excited about trying to move to New Mexico. That's where Cassie's parents are. It's not the choice. Oh, I want to move to the hot-ass southwest desert. Ooh, sign me up. I know it's going to be hot there. It also gets super cold at night. It's not exactly entirely my own decision, but it's going to probably be somewhere around the New Mexico, Colorado area. Let's continue to look at our Food World Order news on this jam-packed Morning Monarchy, our last episode before we take a little bit of a vacation. Veterans hoping to use medical marijuana to treat PTSD had their hopes extinguished yet again after those evil Republicans shot down the Veterans Equal Access Amendment to allow doctors to discuss medical cannabis with patients. Republicans on the House Rules Committee rejected the Veterans Equal Access Amendment this week that would have allowed Veterans Affairs doctors to discuss medical marijuana treatment with veterans in states where it's legal. Representative Earl Bowtie Blumenauer, Democrat from Oregon, who used to get my vote but doesn't anymore, who sponsored the amendment, said he was bitterly disappointed veterans had been failed, despite the amendment receiving bipartisan support from nine Democrats and nine Republicans. The lawmakers wouldn't let the amendment be included in the House's proposed Veterans Administration funding bill for next year, meaning it won't even be brought up for debate on the House floor. While medical marijuana is legal now in 29 states, it remains illegal on a federal level, so VA doctors are prevented from discussing it with patients. The amendment would have allowed VA doctors to recommend and place patients on state medical marijuana programs. Now, we'll see how long this can go, because honestly, the tide has turned. The tide has completely turned. When you have people like my mom and Pat Robertson saying, well, if people find help from medical marijuana, then it's actually immoral for me to stop that. I think the tide has turned. The Jeff Sessions and the Monsantos, they're going to try, and they're going to try and stop it, but I don't think they can do it. And that's what we talk about on the Mary Jane Report. The very nature of cannabis is a great way to look 
freedom in general. It's a nice micro to macrocosm. Say what? Oh, hey, this just in, you guys. Americans really don't like tea that much. <laughs> Starbucks to close all 379 Tivana stores as the tea business completely tanks. Now, I hadn't actually heard of Tivana. I asked Cassie about that. She was like, yeah, well, the Starbucks tea. And of course, Starbucks bought Tazo. They buy everything. That's how that works. Whether we're talking about food, whether we're talking about media, whether we're talking about military, they buy up their competition. That's how this free market works. So that's a bunch of stores getting closed down. And guess what, though? Good news. All those people that are going to get fired, you get the opportunity to reapply for a job at a regular Starbucks. Hey, but I hear a big, uh, awesome Foxconn factory is going to open up in Wisconsin, so you also got that option, too. Last couple of Food World Order stories before we uh, put on our special goggles and start to look at the eclipse that's coming up here in Oregon. We've got uh, maybe some good news, maybe some bad news. Some things are bad, some things are good again, and then if we wait a couple of months, maybe a couple of years, that bad thing will be good. Drinking alcohol most days a week can significantly protect against developing diabetes, research has shown. A study of more than 70,000 men and women found consuming alcohol three or four days a week was associated with a reduced risk of 27% in men and 32% in women compared with abstaining. Wine was found to have a bigger effect than beer, probably because it contains chemical compounds that improve blood sugar balance. But there was a warning to women to stay clear of the gin bottle. A daily tipple of mother's ruin or other spirits increased the diabetes risk to women by 83. Previous studies had already suggested that light to moderate alcohol consumption can cut the risk of diabetes, but the new research was the first to focus on drinking frequency. And this article on ITV.com breaks down into the pieces and the percentages and who did what where. So drinking alcohol regularly now is good for you. So let's remember that. The flip side, however, as our buddy Ray Vahi tweeted at us, sunscreen, however, is now really bad for us. But does this article want to load for me? It sure does. The science on sun exposure is clear. Too much of the sun's ultraviolet radiation leads to sunburns rapidly aging skin, and potentially skin cancer. And that risk? It isn't minimal. An estimated 20% of Americans will develop skin cancer during their lifetimes, making it the most common form of cancer in the country. To lower their risk, many Americans turn to sunscreens, sprays, lotions, and even powders to protect their skin from the worst of the sun's effects. But what do scientists have to say about sunscreen? Unfortunately, while the choice to protect yourself from the sun is a no-brainer, the question of how to do it is a little more contentious. Reports in recent years, most notably the Environmental Working Group's annual sunscreen safety ratings, have raised concern that the thing we turn to for protection might actually be causing us harm. Is sunscreen secretly bad for us? Well, does it have the three little words? Avobenzone, retinal palmitate, and oxybenzone? Those are probably things you don't want to put on your skin. And here's a genius, brilliant idea from the chat. The sun, okay, hmm, the sun has apparently been burning for thousands of years. What if you wear a hat and long sleeves? God damn it, you're a genius. Let's wrap this show up right now. And yes, I know it's hot in New Mexico. It's also going to be 110 here in Oregon on Thursday when we head out to the hippie Pickathon Music Festival. <laughs> that is if I don't completely bail on it and just stay here in the house with Frankie. So that's half of your morning monarchy. That's your cyberspace war, and that's your food world order news. I actually had to get two browsers. I had to load up two browsers to be able to bust through all this. Now the other part, though, is I gotta find out... I gotta find out where this music is coming from. Oh, it's coming from here. Look at mommy. It's coming from the hill. Oh, I hate you auto video loading pages. Yes, global stupidity is being groomed by a few corporations who spew this stuff. And that's how it goes. You are listening to Your Morning Monarchy for Tuesday, August 1st, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. 
A little bit of sweat forming on my forehead even right now as we're halfway through this episode. Hope you're doing well. We are streaming live at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. So have you heard about the big eclipse coming up? August 21st, 2017, the shadow of a total solar eclipse will cross the entire continental United States the first time since 1918, and astrologers, according to Newsweek and other sources, say perhaps it will be a disaster for President Trump, but he may not be the only one looking to the heavens to a troublesome late August. This is coming from our buddy Lauren Coleman, who's got a post on eclipse, disasters, and suicides? Question mark. There are some who are waiting for something to happen on August 21st or August 22nd. We all know that there'll be specific talk of certain known events for those days. It's the unknown that causes fear to build. The solar eclipse has a good deal of people quite excited. There's actually a gigantic festival happening outside of Portland because you basically have to go about an hour away out of Portland south to get that full totality band. That starts to get down into Bend and Silverton, Oregon. Everybody's going there. Everybody, there's concerts, all the Airbnbs, all that shit is all completely booked up. Now, if I remember anything from Night of the Comet, these kind of events kind of make me want to go, hey, guess what? Yeah, I don't want to look at any of that. If everybody's into doing something, you can bet your bottom dollar I ain't going to do it. So fortunately, we actually do have a little more time to talk about the eclipse before the eclipse actually comes. Again... This is our last day of Media Monarchy broadcast. We're going to take about a week and a half off. We will return to the airwaves on Monday, August 14th. That will be one week until the big vaunted eclipse. So actually, this piece from Lauren Coleman has all kinds of action through it. It's got asteroids, it's got grunge suicides, and it's got the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at the end of it. Everybody's kind of losing it. A Fox News alert and London's Daily Mail is reporting that baby Charlie Gard has died in London. The 11-month-old boy whose struggle captured the hearts and the attention of the world has apparently died in hospice care, according to the Daily Mail. His parents had fought to bring him to the United States for medical treatment. That, of course, was denied by the courts in London. They even had to fight the courts to try to bring him home to die, and the courts denied that request. So Charlie was moved to hospice just yesterday, and the little boy who had a rare genetic disorder apparently has died in hospice in London. More ahead on the short life of Charlie Gard. Such a massive, massive kind of weepy story. And those are, again, what passes for a lot of the news anymore. You see Elizabeth Warren tweeting about all the poor people and all this stuff. Using emotional arguments. Now, we briefly mentioned the Charlie Guard story last Thursday as they were basically going to take him off life support. And as we were playing for you, the clip where ABC News stealthily edited out every part where the family mentioned the state won't let us, the courts won't let us. We're trying to take care of our kid, even if you want to just send your kid to America to be experimented on. Isn't that probably your choice, if that's really your only choice left? So these things, of course, bring us into holy hexes. These are the stories we typically talk about on Thursdays. That's the dark, disturbing underbelly of the world. State prosecutor and son of an infamous figure in the Watergate scandal was arrested on child pornography charges at his home in Coronado, reports CBS affiliate KFMB, California prosecutor and California deputy attorney general. So that's one thing if you can say, oh, he's a prosecutor, oh, he's a lawmaker. But if you say California Deputy Attorney General Raymond Joseph Liddy, age 53, reportedly taken into custody and booked into federal jail last Tuesday, he is the son of Watergate criminal G. Gordon Liddy. Raymond Liddy was accused of possessing pornographic images. He has pled not guilty. This is the beginning of a case that we will go to the end and figure out what this is all about, said Liddy's attorney. San Diego Union-Tribune reports Liddy was released on a 100,000 bond. The Attorney General's office said Wednesday it is aware of the matter and has placed Liddy on administrative leave. The newspaper reported that the complaint said an electronic service provider sent a tip to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children in January that a user had uploaded an image that appeared to be child porn. A month later, another provider sent a tip to the organization. So let this be known. Your ISPs are spying on everything you do, and they will rat you out. Just like your banks, just like your post office, just like your mailman, just like the geek squad, just like all of it. Your trash trucks. 
They're all being deputized. They're all little Eichmann spying on you. Now, we talk about Pedogate and Pizzagate and all of this, and we've talked about it from the very beginning of Media Monarchy. We've talked about the Franklin scandal. We've talked about Mark Dutro. We've talked about all of it. We also know that a lot of this, the satanic panic, all it, is a giant intelligence operation. Something is definitely going on. So that's the son of a Watergate criminal. Oh, wait, sorry, I almost forgot Jeffrey Epstein. We could just go on this list down and on and on and on and on. More Pedogate news? Authorities have arrested 37 in an anti-human trafficking operation conducted by federal, state, and local law enforcement in Midland, Texas. The majority were charged for trying to engage in sexual acts with a child under 14 or a prostitute under 18. Operation Damascus lasted from July 11th to July 25th and was jointly conducted by the Texas Department of Public Safety, the FBI, Homeland Security, Midland Police, and Midland County District Attorney's Office. Isn't Midland where the bushes are fake from? I mean, they're carpetbaggers from Kenny Bunkport, Maine. But then they set up their little cowboy set in Midland. The number of arrests came as a surprise to the small town Midland, said Laura Nodolf, Midland County District Attorney. Anytime that you have a situation where you think about children being hurt, people don't want to think about that. For this to come to light, for this to come to light that in our community, we're able to arrest, have 37 offenses in that time period has been very much a shock to our community. Nine suspects were arrested for online solicitation of a minor. They had arranged online a meeting with a person they believed was a 13-year-old and then went to the agreed place expecting sexual acts from the girl. Another 18 were arrested for prostitution solicitation of a person under 18. They made contact with someone online that they believed was a prostitute under 18 and then went to a designated location to meet. Talks about some of the other arrests. Two females were arrested for prostitution. The agents scoured the dark web, web pages only accessible using specialized tools, as well as normally accessible pages to put up ads to lure child predators. Small town shocked by mass arrest in child trafficking sting operation. As we continue to look at the dark holy hexes world, our last story will help us transition into the media memes. James Packer, which is not a name I was familiar with, it's only a lot of times when we're on websites and we see on the sidebar all the all the celebrity garbage, which Daily Mail is fantastic for, which is where we get this article. James Packer quietly severs business ties with the Church of Scientology after former fiancé Mariah Carey blamed the controversial religion for their split. James Packer quietly severed business ties with the Church of Scientology nearly a decade after withdrawing from the secretive religion. Scientology spokesman Tommy Davis this week left Packer's CPH Investment Company after the billionaire abandoned U.S. gambling expansion plans. The Casino King's former fiance Mariah Carey, last year accused Davis of being a key reason behind their split, so says the Sydney Morning Herald. Miss Carey, 47, and Mr. Packer, 49, parted ways after a blazing row on board the billionaire's yacht in Greece in September. Sources close to Carey alleged Davis assumed control of Packer's investments, but put him on a detox program and ordered he disconnect from the pop star. The allegations vehemently disputed by sources close to Packer who said the split with Carrie was due to her lavish spending and drama-prone ways. It's, I suppose not surprising all the places, all the ways, all the little areas that Scientology are able to wiggle into. Yeah, speaking of intelligence-run operations, there's another fantastic one. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy. It's the Everything Edition. I'm James Evan Pilato. It's August 1st. So let's move into our media memes coverage for our last section here on your morning show. We've also got brand new Bell and Sebastian music and This Day in History coming up as well. LA Times reports Netflix is over $20 billion in debt. The streaming service has had dozens of victories over the past few years, but it turns out it is bleeding cash. I think this falls under all the other elements that we talk about and expect. Oh, they're going to be around forever. Oh, Blockbuster's going to be around forever. Oh, Facebookers. Oh, they're never going to go away until they totally do. Just like we were talking about Friday, when Spotify and SoundCloud and all the rest of them all disappear, 
or morph into something else, you will have no record collection. You will have no movie collection. And to a lot of people, they don't really care. Maybe they never really cared about much anyway. But I find value in some of those things. You've seen any of my videos. You, of course, have seen my records behind me. I've been collecting them on uh, maybe about like 39 years. A company owned by Bill Gates is placing companies' products in Netflix and Amazon shows. And you think they don't have advertising. Almost all Amazon shows have at least one product placement. And about 74% of Netflix do, said Greg Isaacs, chief product and marketing officer at integration company Branded Entertainment. Branded Entertainment Network, B-E-N, which is owned by Bill Gates places products in TV shows, streaming content, and in digital influencer videos. Those are horror videos. The company, which used to be a part of Corbis, did over 6,000 placements last year, including getting Dunkin' Donuts and GM into House of Cards, Tin Cup Whiskey and Jessica Jones, Jose Cuervo in Fuller House. <laughs> Seems rather odd, but all right. Ben isn't the only company doing this on the biggest online film and TV platforms. Paneria. I thought it was Panera for a second. Paneria Film Productions and Brand Aid Entertainment teamed up to get Anheuser-Busch InBev products in House of Cards. So getting your company in a Netflix or Amazon show costs between about $50,000 to $500,000 per episode. The price is determined by how long the product is in the episode and the popularity of the show. I know you've seen this. and It's so obvious. I make jokes about the league. I enjoyed the league. There were just heinous product placements in there. All the Pizza Hut and all the things. and ah, That's kind of why I like, uh, speaking of another dumb show, Workaholics. At least on that show, it seems like they invented a beer. The beer they're always drinking is, I, I think, made up. Y you want more streaming stories? Angelina Jolie denies exploiting Cambodian children for a new Netflix film. The suggestion that real money was taken from a child during an audition is false and upsetting. Angelina Jolie has denied that Cambodian children were exploited on the set of her latest film amid accusations that they were forced to stage a mock battle for money. A mock battle for money. That's pretty much just the whole world news in general right there. The actress has directed, First, They Killed My Father, a Netflix film about the murderous Khmer Rouge regime in the 70s Cambodia. But a recent Vanity Fair interview highlighted the unorthodox process to cast child actors in the film with impoverished orphans being forced to snatch money away in a bid to bag the role. I'm shocked. Shocked, I tell you. I would have thought so much better from a Council on Foreign Relations front. Now, we mentioned it briefly yesterday morning as it was breaking news at the time, but let's take a moment and pay our respects to the late, the great Sam Shepard. We celebrate the life of Sam Shepard. Pulitzer Prize winning playwright and an Oscar nominated actor proving over and over again he had the right stuff. Here's ABC's David Wright. Like the rugged characters he created yeah, but on stage crazy. and on screen, Sam Shepard had hidden depths. As test pilot Chuck Yeager in The Right Stuff, hey Ridley, you got any demons? Yeah, thank you. He was the unsung hero, a cowboy aviator proudly going his own way. And he was nominated for an Oscar. Shepard had the leading man looks and the soul of a poet. He won a Pulitzer Prize as a playwright for Barry Child and was nominated two more times for True West and Fool for Love. I took her out to dinner once. You're alive. Okay, twice. He starred in the film version. A critic once called him the poet laureate of America's emotional badlands, his intimate family portraits full of pain and grace. You're causing a lot of trouble here. Huh? I'm causing trouble? You're a pain in the butt. His partner for 30 years was actress Jessica Lange. Notoriously private, he never announced his battle with Lou Gehrig's disease. He died at home in Kentucky, remembered by friends and fans as a hero. Is that a man? Sam Shepard was 73. And he played West Virginia hero Chuck Yeager in The Right Stuff. And I was actually in a, a brief production of True West back in the theater days. Sam Shepard's work does resonate with me on a certain level because so much of it is about what he calls the two sides of the self, the flesh and the spirit. And it also kind of has that those family battles, the brother battles. And again, that resonates with me as well. Another R.I.P.? 
Jean Moreau, the actor best known for her performance in French New Wave classic Jules and Jim, died at the age of 89 at her home in Paris. A director, screenwriter, and singer, as well as stage and screen actor, Moreau came to prominence with a series of roles in films considered part of the French New Wave, including Lift to the Scaffold and Jules and Jim. She also appeared in a number of Hollywood films, such as The Last Tycoon with De Niro and Orson Welles' adaptation of Franz Kafka's The Trial. In a statement on Twitter, the French, French president Emmanuel Macron paid tribute to Moreau, saying the actor embodied cinema and was a free spirit who always rebelled against the established order. So that's our other RIP on this episode. And as we start to wrap it up with our media meme stories after spending the last few years on other projects, Jack White is back in the studio working on the follow-up to 2014's Lazaretto. His label, Third Man, has confirmed the news. And as we have recently mentioned on the music show, if you didn't know this, so many Orson Welles references just weaved all throughout Jack White's work. Third Man Records, Union Forever, the Rita Hayworth song, and the tons. SoundCloud is getting close to a lifeline, however, it will cost them their independence. It is grim times for SoundCloud between massive job cuts and talk of mismanagement, but help might be coming soon at a steep cost. Bloomberg sources understand that SoundCloud is in advanced talks to sell stakes in the company to two as yet unnamed private equity firms. The deals would ensure the streaming music stays afloat, but it would also hand majority control to outside companies. In essence, SoundCloud would be giving up its vaunted independence in order to keep the lights on. And that's our world. That's our mergers and acquisitions. Those are our murders and executions. And we will end with one more as Discovery acquires scripts for $14 billion. We want to get to this breaking news really quickly. Discovery Communications says it will acquire Scripps Networks Interactive. $14.6 billion. So it's done. John, what do you think? You're, you're putting me on the spot on this one. I don't you know. know I don't know the mechanics of, of that deal. You don't need to know the it. mechanics, but what about so. the just the <laughs> combination content and the critical importance to they get leverage in terms of how they might be able to distribute this content themselves? Lindsay, you have a, do you have a view on this? Scripps, I'm, I'm passing the Scripps, buck. Scripps I, owns the the Food Network among others, and this has been a deal that's I mean, talked about for some time. Yeah, I think it just goes to show that the battle for content is uh, raging. And I mean, you saw Sprint also the deal I, with Charter Communications. I'll tell you, I, I do like deals that. that involve that that involve content for content. Thank and, you. Yeah, that I think is I think that encapsulates a lot of the lamestream media right there. Hey, let's talk about this news. Yeah, I don't know anything about it. Ah, don't let your ignorance stop you from blabbing a bunch on TV. <laughs> <laughs> and that, I think, in another way, in a nutshell, is everything that we're sort of working against. But again, it doesn't take yelling and screaming in the streets or bullhorning or being a dick. All it takes is not taking part. There it is. That's your last morning monarchy for about a week and a half. We'll take a little time off. We got concerts. We got campings. We got Seattle. We got concerts. We got my 40th birthday coming up on August 11th. I do accept gifts. You can find all the information at MediaMonarchy.com slash support. That's where the PayPal, the Patreon, the post office box, and the Bitcoin is. As I like to say, if you can give a little, I can give a lot. We've got brand new music from Bell and Sebastian. That's actually who we are going to see next week in Seattle. They've got like three West Coast shows this entire year. They don't even have a new record, but they do have a brand new single, which we will listen to. We Were Beautiful by Bell and Sebastian at the end of this episode. But first, let's take a look at this day in history. August 1st, 1936, the Olympics opened in Berlin with a ceremony presided over by all the bankers' friends, Adolf Hitler. August 1st, 1944, the Warsaw Uprising against the Nazi German occupation breaks out in Warsaw, Poland, because this was the point where the bankers had stopped funding Hitler. It got really messy and ugly. August 1st, 1957, the United States and Canada form NORAD on this day, the North American Aerospace Defense Command. On this day in 1960, Chuck Berry, or rather, Chubby Checkers, The Twist, was released. In 1961, U.S. Defense Secretary Robert McNamara orders the creation of the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, the nation's first centralized military espionage organization. And it would be things like the DIA that would help murder little kids in Cambodia and Laos a few years later. They mentioned it in Natural Born Killers, but on this day, August 1st, 1966... 
Former military man Charles Whitman kills 16 people at the University of Texas at Austin before being killed by the police. Up in the tower, UT. August 1st, 1971, the concert for Bangladesh, organized by former Beatle George Harrison, was held at Madison Square Garden in New York City. 1972, on this day, the Eagles' Witchy Woman was released. And on August 1st, 1981, if advertisers make the video disco channel a success, the implications for cable television and the recording industry could be far-reaching, wrote a New York Times business columnist in the summer of 1981 about the upcoming premiere of a new cable television network dedicated exclusively to popular music. This prediction proved to be an understatement of historic proportions, though not exactly overnight. Though the premiere of MTV on this day in 1981 would later be seen as the beginning of a whole new era in popular culture, only a few thousand Night Owl subscribers to a single northern New Jersey cable system were able to witness the televised revolution. Seven, six, five, four. We've gone for main engine start. We have main engine start. Rock and roll. This is it. Welcome to MTV Music Television, the world's first 24 hour stereo video music channel. Now, just moments ago, all of the VJs and the crew here at MTV collectively hit our executive producer, Sue Steinberg, over the head with a bottle of champagne, and behold, a new concept is born. The best of TV combined with the best of radio. Now, starting right now, you'll never look at music the same way again. We'll be right back to introduce the other VJs and the other folks who are going to be with us on MTV. I'm Alan Hunter. I'll be with you right after Mark. We'll be covering the latest in music news coast to coast here on MTV Music Television. I'm Martha Quinn. The music will continue non-stop on MTV Music Television, the newest component of your stereo system. Well, all right, I'm J.J. Jackson, and I'll be sitting in with the latest video music performances the way they were meant to be. That's in stereo on MTV Music Television. You'll never look at music the same way again. Hi, I'm Nina Blackwood, and I'll be with you after J.J. right here on MTV, the world's first video music channel, all day, all night, in stereo. Are those guys the best? We all are so excited about this new concept in TV. We'll be doing for TV what FM did for radio. And let's get into it right now at MTV. That's the first two minutes of MTV on this day, August 1st, 1981. 1984, commercial peat cutters discovered the preserved bog body of a man called Lindo Man at Lindo Moss, Cheshire, England. August 1st, 1994, Michael Jackson and Lisa Marie Presley announced that they got married 11 weeks ago. And on this day in 1996, MTV launched another channel known as MTV2, where it would play videos only for a little while until they turned into the same crappy one their parent is. Finally, August 1st, 2008, 11 Mountaineers from International Expeditions died on K2, the second highest mountain on Earth, in the worst single accident in the history of K2 mountaineering. Published to my own website a decade ago today, Media Monarchy has been online since September 11th, 2005. Longer than some of your other bigger and favorite, more popular shows. <laughs> Published to Media Monarchy a decade ago today, Rumsfeld changes course, will testify on Tillman death. Former Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld will testify at a hearing on the friendly fire death of Army Specialist and former NFL player Pat Tillman. Oakland, California to transform red light cameras into spy cameras. U.S. agrees to $30 billion defense aid deal with Israel. Captured and killed Al-Qaeda figure was invented. Kissinger-led U.S. group attends closed debate at Putin's home. Senior French politician dares to question the 9-11 tale, and Poll says much of the U.S. favors Bush impeachment. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Oh, we were so sure George Bush was going to get impeached, right? And I bet a lot of people think that's going to happen again. But guess what? Probably not. Celebrating birthdays today? Holy moly. August 1st, born on this day. Francis Scott Key. Herman Melville. Ramblin' Jack Elliott, Dom DeLuise, Yves St. Laurent, 
Al D'Amato, Terry Weekend Bernie's Kaiser, Ron Clinton Deathpool Brown. It's also Jerry Garcia's birthday. It's also the late, great Jim Carroll's birthday of the Basketball Diaries. I actually have maybe told you the story. I got to see him read poetry at the Black Cat in D.C. Robert Cray's birthday, Howard Kurtz, late, great stand-up Taylor Negron. He also delivered a pizza so we could enjoy some pizza and learn about Cuba. Michael Penn, Joe Elliott from Def Leppard, Chuck D from Public Enemy, Dean Wareham from Luna and Galaxy 500, Sam Mendes, Tom Woods, Don Hertzfeld, and Coolio. All those folks celebrating birthdays today. Tuesday means Tech Tuesday, so your uh, daily DJ set at noon is going to have a little bit of bump and new electronic music, brand new music from Lolly Puna and other bands. But we'll also work in some of those some of those birthday folks. And now we reach the end. Brand new music from Bell and Sebastian. Their last album is now about three years old. So this is the first new music from Bell and Sebastian in about the last three years. And you can tell it does sound like it's from the sessions of Girls in Peacetime Just Wanna Dance, their last full length. This brand new single from Bell and Sebastian, We Were Beautiful. And that's how we send off a little bit of a media monarchy vacation. Again, this is our last episode. We will return to the airwaves Monday, August 14th. I hope you have a safe and beautiful and fantastic August. And of course, you can always reach out to us. James at MediaMonarchy.com. We are accessible, and we're brought to you by you. There it is, your Morning Monarchy for Tuesday, August 1st, 2017. I am James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com, thanking you from the bottom of my heart for taking part. And like our buddy Richard Grove says, for tuning in and not dropping out. And like Jella Biafra says, don't hate the media, become the media. Take care. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology and the occult, all remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com slash support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.